half second. No, and somebody's chat. I think that's the chat. Is that the chat noise? It's not the chat noise. I don't know what that noise is. Ah, oh, it's the, okay. I do that every night. It's the record thing. I, I'd like to say I'm not this bumbling, but I am. Okay. Well, uh, here's what we got as a class. Okay. So the least, the thing you want to drive or you want to live next to the least is the liquor store followed by the apartment building and then the pawn shop. Okay. I'm actually surprised by this. Um, if uh, I'm not saying you're wrong, this is your opinion. If I was doing it, I'm going to pick dog food manufacturing facilities. So that actually is one of those in Flagstaff. It's where much of the Arizona dog food uh, comes from. It's fairly stinky because uh, of the things that dogs uh, enjoy to eat. Uh, anyway, so potential. So all, all of these three, these four things all have some sort of negative effect um, on the rest of the neighborhood, right? So drive through liquor store, you got potential for drunk driving and sometimes you know, sort of, um, you know, ne'er-do-well type folks hang out there near there or something like that. Large apartment building to, to U of A students, okay? So there's like this battle actually in the middle, middle of Tucson where, um, you know, it's expensive to live in the dorms, right? And apartments around there. So uh, private companies have realized the price has gone up. So let's increase the quantity of, uh, of apartments for students. So they built these very tall uh, things. Unfortunately, some students, most, you know, most U of A students, most college students are responsible people but some people wreck it for everybody else and drop things off those things or have loud parties and stuff like that. So uh, it's been an issue. Pawn shops uh, sometimes uh, attracts an element of, of stolen goods or uh, other elements of crime. So, you know, uh, no wrong answer here. And what I normally do in class, if we're actually in person, I have you write down what the minimum amount is that you, if you were, say you won the lottery, how much would you be willing to pay to get rid of that building? Okay, uh, and what I'm trying to do is capture how much are you actually bothered by it, right? Because somebody might say they're bothered by it, but they may not pay uh, any amount of money, right? Um, when the uh, we live pretty close to the Top Golf uh, up in, in uh, I guess it's Marin, I don't know, whatever, uh, Northwest Tucson, uh, and when they built that, my wife was you know upset because they uh, it sort of blocks her view of the mountains. I don't think it does, but um, so. There's these nets uh, that, that sort of block it, but she's not really willing to pay any money to get rid of it, right? So is she bothered by it? If she's not willing to pay, you know, we're not, that's how we quantify that. Uh, the last three, those are things you usually want to live near, okay? So fancy resort, elementary school. Elementary school does have a negative thing. Who wants to tell us what the, the potential negative thing for an elementary school would be? Traffic in the morning. Yeah, traffic in the morning and traffic in the afternoon, right? So, uh, and, and if I put a high school, uh, it's going to be even worse, right? Maybe I should change that to, to high school. Really? I thought that increased value. Well, it depends on the school, and uh, it probably does increase value. Um, so in, in this case, in this um, example here, uh, I'm not really asking whether or not what what the val what the money monetary value is that you place on it just just which one would bother you guys or not so gotcha yeah uh, and then grassy park full of shady trees people like living near that right so um, this is really the problem of economics right you got those first or the not the problem of economics it's a problem it's a market failure and uh, it's one that we actually have a hard time dealing with. Uh, because people feel very passionate about it. They're not usually willing to do the math uh, on either side. So these first four, these private businesses, these are all four private businesses, but they affect your neighborhood, right, in some kind of negative way, or perhaps the other businesses, right? Uh, and then these last three, these are actually some positive things, right? I think that was uh, Justin uh, pointing out that, you know, rightly so, a, a nice, well-kept uh, elementary school will bring up your property value, right? So will a nice resort, so will a park. Um, you notice I said kept up, right? You know, a, a, a park, uh, like some of the parks we have here in Tucson where uh, homeless people live there, that may bring down the value of your, your house. Or if the elementary school is not well taken care of, right? Or, um, or the resort uh, closes down, or the golf course closes down, or something like that, right? Many of the problems. Um, so people are getting benefits on these last three that they're not paying for in the neighborhood, and people are getting costs 
that they don't necessarily want and aren't being paid for in those first four. So that's that's the issue that, uh, that we're gonna deal with today. And these are what we call those in economics, we call them externalities, okay? An externality is any external effect due to economic activity. Okay, so anything outside the direct exchange. So say I took a, a plane ride on, well, it's not US Airways anymore, but American Airlines. Back in my days, America West, anyway. Um, so if I, if I took this plane ride on it and your house was down here, uh, I have affected your house. I, it's a private transaction between myself and the airline, but I have changed the value of, of your house or at least imposed noise polluting costs on you, right? So, you know, would you want to live right next to the, the airport? Probably not, okay, because of the noise. Um, in fact, when airlines uh, change the flight pattern, often they will, or, or increase flight traffic, they will pay the neighborhood uh, for like better windows, right? So noise, noise cancel, or noise proofing windows to prevent that issue, okay? So we don't really necessarily want to live next to the airport. However, different question, do we want to own a business next to the airport, okay? Um, so in this case, yes, we likely do want to own a business next to the airport because we got more customers, okay? The kind of customer that we have has a more inelastic demand, right? They have more money they because they're flying. They are often in a hurry, or they're flying into Tucson, in which case they don't have a lot of choices, right? A lot of the times there's hotels around there, restaurants that are a little more expensive around airports and things like that. So uh, different economic problem based on who you are, right? So that's gonna change the nature of the externality, but it's gotta be something external, okay? So it's something, a negative externality is to be imposed on somebody else, a positive externality is to be a benefit given to somebody else that they didn't get paid for, okay? Any questions on the definition of that? Okay, and these are one of the, the market failures, right? Because we have these costs that aren't being paid for and we have these benefits that aren't being paid for. So that's, that's where uh, the market has just failed, right? Uh, so here is a map of the middle of Tucson. Okay, so we've got a bunch of stuff here. Let's go to the chat window. What buildings or things on the map cause negative externalities? Okay, so what, what causes a negative externality? It's like U of A probably, right? We'll type it in there. We'll talk about it. Um, you're right, but it, it's a little more complex than that, but yeah. And if you know some things on this map uh, that I didn't, that Google didn't show us, uh, you can put it too. See what we got. Okay. We've got two ideas here. Sydney, tell us more about the bars. There you go. We got three three answers. Either it's too hard. Or you all aren't paying attention. Could be something you specifically know in this area too.
There's a new one over here on 22nd. Not quite on my map. It's causing causing a ruckus. I love it, but I live way over here. We know that one? Right about here. One second. This is near 29th. Lots of fast moving vehicles in and out of there. You couldn't get Google Maps to annotate everything here. Let's see, what we got we got nothing. One more idea. Come on, Matthew and Travis. What do we? There you go. There you go, Robert. There you go, Matthew. All right. So let's go back to here. And if I uh, if I don't say one, I'm I'm away from the chat, so I'm not looking at it. All right. So good. So you guys got the freeway. Um, the freeway uh, causes uh, pollution. Uh, so noise pollution. Um, more cars, traffic, and, uh, and air pollution, right? Now, do I want to, so I don't necessarily want to live over there, but do I want to uh, have a business right there? Absolutely, right? So a pretty good place to have a business. Um, Justin mentioned the U of A. So the U of A is actually both. So it has definitely has negatives, right? Uh, the people that live in the neighborhood uh, who dislike you guys that um, for the party reasons and the uh, sports traffic and stuff like that. Um, but uh, real estate values around the U of A are actually uh, the highest, and you know, proportionally in the city, right? In terms of like square footage and stuff, um, maybe there in the foothills. But uh, because of the also the positive externality, right, of, of living near a pretty good looking campus. Uh, okay, so the bars, right? Bars are really going to be like drunk driving, right? Uh, that kind of thing, noise, stuff like that. Uh, I think it was Matthew that said the zoo. The zoo kind of stinks uh, and can be kind of loud. Um, this right here is Reed Park. Now, Reed Park probably causes uh, positive externalities for the most part. Uh, it's a pretty nice park and stuff like that. I couldn't sh I couldn't zoom the map out um, well enough for the the golf course. So, golf courses are really pretty. Uh, do if I live now, you can't live right along this one, and there's a big fence around it. But if, if other other courses, people live right on the course, and then golfers like me show up. Uh, and then hit golf balls into their houses and windows and stuff. So uh, another externality problem, right? So they have the beauty of the golf course, but then the, the crappy golfer shows up. Uh, let me make sure I don't have any others. I didn't see. We got zoo, the freeway. Good. Oh, and then the helicopter's good. So uh, the helicopter's coming in out of, of hospitals, right? So that's uh, right about there. The new one I was referencing is the Amazon building. So the Amazon warehouse building is right about here. Uh, and if you just go to the star, the, the newspaper has an article about that, uh, about how people, people are getting, uh, not, I shouldn't laugh. Sorry. Uh, they're, uh, they're running into, uh, you know, fast driving vans, right. To bring us our, our packages. I kind of wish Amazon would just slow down. Right? But, uh, anyway, that's right there. It's right, right near, uh, the Tucson city jail, right. Which would probably not be a thing you'd want to live necessarily. Next to. So any questions about just our town? Okay. Uh, so the big one worldwide and one that I'll, I'll use in this example, perhaps you've heard of this, perhaps you haven't, but uh, there's a bunch of garbage. Again, I don't know why I'm laughing. That's not cool. Uh, anyway, a bunch of garbage out in the ocean. Um, and it's a lot of it is just plastic stuff. It's like uh, the little toys that my... Uh, daughter has that we throw away and water bottles and stuff like that. There's a whole bunch of these. So the Pacific ones are probably the bigger ones. And then there's a couple more around. Um, some of the various ideas um, are to like this, this Swedish company and entrepreneur dude, he wanted to like scoop up the, uh, the, the plastic. But the problem is it's like a lawnmower when it, you know, when you go over really tall grass, you get like five feet and then it's full and it's kind of way out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so it's really hard to clean up. Um, I have some shoes that are actually made out of ocean plastic. So there's companies that are going out there and getting it and then turning it into other things. So that's kind of cool, right? So as an entrepreneur, you can uh, think through some of these problems. Um, 
So that's the, the negative externality there. Uh, back to our drinking example. This is from uh, England. Okay, so the, the bars and, and hotels and stuff on this street, uh, they have to pick up this trash at the end of, uh, end of every night. Uh, been kind of documented, right? The whole uh, uh, article here in Time Magazine from uh, several years ago where they're just this, this, uh, this young uh, drinking culture that exists. Okay. Uh, next one is Disneyland. Well, I'll let you guys do this. And what are the so Disneyland's really, really happy and people love it, right? Uh, and as a Disney shareholder, you should all, you know, visit Disneyland when they open back up again. But anyhow, uh, what are the two negative externalities for the, the people of Anaheim? There's two that I can think of. Probably traffic would be terrible. Yep, traffic is one. And then uh, somebody else was talking there? Uh, I just had to check the chat. Oh, check the chat. Okay. Let's see. Oh, I and I just showed it to you. Dang it. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah. And Justin, you're right about the, the park's value. Um, I was just reading an article about Central Park in, in New York that actually used to be a dump and you didn't want to live, live there. And now it's the most expensive real estate in the world. Um, anyway, so yeah, good point. And I just showed it to you, right? So, oh, dang it. Uh, so every night Disneyland has a fireworks show, uh, and that's caused, uh, it causes noise pollution, right? So it'd be kind of cool to, to see that a couple times, but you probably don't want to see it every night, right? Dogs barking and all that stuff. Um, so there's that issue. Um, so negative externalities, even, even through like some kind of positive business, right? Uh, and the city of Anaheim is going to let Disney do whatever they want because that brings in so much business. Uh, tax revenue, so they're not, they're not going to say anything about it, really. Uh, so there's that. Whereas if you were a uh, different kind of business, you know, not as important to a city, they're, they're going to stop you. For example, here in Tucson, uh, we have laws, probably too restrictive, that's my opinion. Um, but it basically says you can't put a sign up, like a new large sign, because you'll block somebody else's view of the mountains. Okay. Um, so what companies will do, they'll leave up their old signs because if they tear them down, they'll never be allowed to put up a, a new sign. So if you know where Campbell and uh, Grant is, there's a very large Bookman sign and there's an old movie theater sign. The buildings are even gone, but the signs are still there. So that's why the signs are still there because the, the sign has value because of this ordinance here in the city of Tucson. But if we didn't have beautiful uh, purple mountains, then it uh, wouldn't be a big deal, okay? Uh, other ex another externality, this is, uh, old President Reagan before he was president. He's an actor and here he is uh, selling cigarettes, right? Now, the, now be careful though, the negative externality is not on the smoker, right? So the smoker is buying something that, um, you know, is hurting them, hurting their lungs. But the, the, the negative externality is secondhand smoke to people around him or her who, who aren't smoking, okay? Um, so, when e-cigs first came out, a lot of, many economists were, were kind of excited about it because if, you know, science is kind of hazy now that people are going to the hospital from it, but um, at the time, if, if there's less secondhand smoke uh, due to those uh, electric cigarettes, then that might be actually better. Even though it's not good, it's less bad, right? So it's one way to think about policies and uh, how we should run them. Uh, now, I'm sure that none of you uh, buy illegal drugs, right? That's bad. You know, drugs are bad. Don't buy drugs, right? And often, um, you know, the policy is, you know, go after the, the drug dealers. But if you think about it, who's actually causing the, the externality, the reason that uh, drug traffickers and, and drug dealers are able to make these huge profits, or at least willing to try to get these huge profits, is because the drug buyers uh, are willing to pay uh, for the for the drugs. So if you don't want to cause more negative externalities in Latin America, parts of Tucson, New York, Chicago, all over the world, don't buy drugs. Tell your friends not to buy drugs. There'll be less misery uh, along the way. Somebody had a question or comment. What is a what does economics say about the drug war? Just out of curiosity, because like you'd think that it would be for it uh, for ending it. So uh, number one uh, answer is going to be it depends. Uh, there, there's not really a, uh, 
uh, a mainstream view on it. What a lot of people who've studied it. So there's an, a pretty famous economist named Gary Becker. Um, Gary Becker is he's a little unusual. He's dead now, but recently died. He uh, he wrote a pretty influential paper in a study that the costs of fighting the drug war for the U.S. government exceed the benefits of fighting the drug war. Right. So. Uh, kind of like with the elasticity example that uh, people of his view say, focus on the drug users, get them to not buy drugs rather than the drug dealers who are always going to try to see a profit on it. But the, uh, I can't say I've ever read a study where that said like, yeah, put more money into the DEA. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I've just never come across that. So I've either seen indifference or, um, uh, some kind, some sort of different view uh, of it or alternative view. Did that answer your question? Yep. Thank you. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, so anyway, there you go. That's my message on on the drug trade. All right. So circular flow model. Um, and you know, it works with drugs, right? There's a drug consumer and a drug dealer. Uh, it's a voluntary exchange, right? Drug dealer it was that old Chris Rock thing, right? Um, drugs sell themselves, you know. It, People, drug dealers don't sell drugs, drug buyers buy them, right? Anyway, um, there's a, a cost, an external cost on consumption if there's a crash or something like that. Uh, and then the drug dealers impose costs on the, the community, right? Through violence or intimidation uh, on people that aren't even buying or selling uh, the drugs, right? Just making the community worse off. But it also works with other things, right? Like pollution, right? Uh, or taking an airplane trip or whatever, the consumer is paying the firm, but they're underpaying uh, because there's these external costs. Now, the question of how much is the, the thing that we all argue about, but we do recognize that there's always external costs and benefits uh, to, to all kinds of businesses. Uh, so that's just another formula thing. I'll put it in the notes there, some other examples. Air pollution is the classic example. Okay, so if you're an environmentalist type person, uh, that is, that I want you to really think about it in terms of an economic uh, issue, right? I mean, it's sad when the polar bears die, but uh, the way to really enact good policies would be to, to look at, um, you know, what are the negative externalities and how much is it worth it to, to try to solve them, okay? Uh, and there's many alternatives that have come out of economics that, that I encourage you to research. In this class, won't really go into those, but if that's something you care about, email me. I, there's uh, some alternative folks that have some pretty good things to say that don't really get listened to, but, uh, but it's pretty effective. Uh, neighbors barking dog, right? And how do you deal with that? Right? Do you do nothing? Do you knock on the door? Um, do you, uh, you know, do something bad to the dog? Like what, how, how much the costs are imposed on you are going to be uh, how much that externality is. Uh, late night stereo, construction projects, uh, secondhand smoke, the one I gave you. Distracted driving is a big one. Uh, so you would never use your phone in the car, of course, but, um, you know, if the number of accidents go up. And for a number of years, number of accidents uh, for young people being distracted was, was falling. Uh, but that's on that was on the rise again. I don't know. I haven't seen what happened in the last three months. I got to imagine there's been less uh, traffic accidents uh, recently. So that's good news. Uh, okay. So any questions over any examples? I mean, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of them. I'm not going to list them forever. Uh, your book gives you, you know, different, different version of it. Everybody's cool. All right. All right. So what would a graph look like? So let's imagine a plastic bottle. Okay. Let's say that you were somewhere near the coast and these plastic bottles cause some kind of additional cost that burdens the ocean creatures. Right. And actually, you can make an argument if the, if the fish eat the plastic or pieces of the plastic and then we eat the fish person who uh or the, the company that made made the bottle somehow affected uh the rest of us right so uh let's do we've got bottles uh, of water okay you know you know i'm talking about those little plastic bottles of water okay uh and we'll do i wonder if i can no it's too much uh, i'll do demand curve and I'd say it's pretty relatively elastic demand curve would you agree with that when the price goes up to like one or two dollars a bottle uh, we don't want it right and when the price is uh, really low five cents we want to buy lots 
Uh, and it kind of depends on where you're at, right? So if you're you know, at a concert, you're going to be faced with that monopoly problem that we'll learn about next week. If you're at Costco, you can get uh, tons of bottles. So let's use the Costco model, right? Uh, so here I've got an equilibrium price. Would you say that a bottle of water uh, per unit would be uh, somewhere in the ballpark of uh, five cents or so at Costco? Agree with that? I mean, not very much money. Yeah. Nobody agrees, disagrees. Five cents by the time I get over there. Yeah, I agree. You agree. All right. There we go. Let's see. Love it. All right. So we're going to go with five. Whoops. 0 0.05. I don't know where the cent function is there. Uh, I just thought of something there, Justin. Many economists think we should get rid of the nickel. They don't even stop at the penny. Uh, it's sort of a... If it, if it costs more than a nickel for the government to make a nickel, probably shouldn't have a nickel. And if it doesn't buy anything, dump that guy. So uh, that's probably a hot topic. Well, it's not a hot topic because many people agree with it. But anyhow, uh, back to this. Okay, so this five cent bottle of water, uh, and that's the equilibrium price. When the price goes up, we buy fewer of them, okay, but the firms don't want to sell more. Uh, and when the price is even lower than this, the companies don't want to sell as many well let's say that we were to we were we did an economic study we estimated I spelled that right uh that the damage comes out to uh we'll say a point let's say two cents a bottle right and that's so that what that is is either cleanup cost or it's the cost of the fish um on that or or whatever right it's just it's some kind of external cost uh, that's going on. Okay, so I am gonna uh, go up to get the pen. We go up two cents. And so if this is six cents and this is seven, I'm gonna go. Okay. So at what that really means is at this quantity, whatever equilibrium quantity is. You know, if you like numbers, let's call that a a million bottles a month or something, right? If, if you don't care about quantity, it's just whatever the equilibrium quantity is. Often we call that Q star, okay? It's, it's not super relevant to what I'm doing. Um, so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to see how the cost of this externality is gonna affect my market here. So um, we say the two cents here. Now, one thing that the professional economists will often argue about is they may, maybe say, oh, you know what, that's too much. It's really only uh, one cent. And then other people say, you know what, this damage is, goes on forever and the sea creatures they die and it's really more like five cents right it just depends whoops depends on how far away from california you are <laughs> just kidding anyway uh i guess i'm not anyway so this right here is so the five cents is the cost this is the private cost to the firm that's selling it and then this extra two cents here okay let me get the orange here this extra two cents comes from that, and this is, we're gonna call this uh, the social cost, right? Now, if I, so, is there, did everybody see why, what, what I've got going on in the market here? I've got an equilibrium of five cents, I've got a quantity of one million, and then I've got this two cents is the environmental damage, the estimate. Okay, such a good explainer. Okay, so now this cost, let's just say for some reason that um, the companies aren't selling as much, right? So we're at a lower quantity. Well, what that means is that the uh, estimated damage is gonna be less because when we're right here at this quantity, this, this would be like the, the four cent uh, cost. So they're, they're going to be uh, right here. So the distance between this and this is that two cents, just as the distance between this, this is two cents. So as I go down here, I'm going to go up two cents. Okay. And the distance between this and this is that social cost. Okay. And I'm going to really keep doing that all the way up the supply curve, right? At every uh, quantity, there is an additional 
two cents, and that's a little crooked, so I'll fix that. Okay. So what this is, this is the supply of bottles plus, we're actually going to call this the marginal social cost. Okay. Uh, and the reason it's marginal is as I increase my quantity, the damage goes up two cents at every quantity. Okay. Because that's the damage from the bottles ending up in the ocean. Okay. So that's the analysis. The, the distance between this marginal social cost and uh, regular S, and regular S is some means supply, but it's sometimes called, the textbook calls it this too, sometimes called the marginal private cost or MPC, uh, because that private cost is only borne by the the uh, companies that are making those water bottles, right? This marginal social cost is the private cost plus uh, damage to the sea creatures and stuff, okay? So that, that's how we graph a negative externality, okay? We're gonna find out what the damage is. Uh, and, and if I was doing like an alternative analysis and said, nah, it's not that big a deal, um, you know, it's gonna be over here, then what I would do is I would redraw the curve and I would have it over here. Right? And if I was doing a more extreme example, I would do it over here. Now, um, if I was, there's a, there's a type of economist called an environmental economist. And you can also imagine that after a certain point, um, the quantity of water bottles, uh, the, the marginal social cost goes through the roof, right? Because what you've got like so much pollution. Uh, and so it actually probably isn't, doesn't have this linear function. It probably has uh, so at some point, it goes like way up high. Right? That might be the argument that those guys would make. Okay, uh, but this is what it is. Okay, so uh, there's one way to, to potentially solve this, uh, and it's sort of the mainstream view that a lot of people have, uh, not necessarily in economics because of what we're going to learn next. Uh, but what would be a what would be a thing we could do uh, in the state of California? I don't know if they do this on water bottles, but they do it on other things. Uh, to potentially solve this problem. You don't have to agree with it, but what, what do a lot of policymakers do to solve this? They, uh... They lost uh, your... Sorry. That's okay. Uh, sorry, they'll tax it to offset the social cost. So yeah. they'll impose like a two to three, five, seven cent tax. Uh, per item and then yep, that's exactly right right now. That's not it, sometimes it's a good idea sometimes it's not a good idea uh, That kind of tax is called an excise tax. It's a per unit tax and it's what we'll learn about uh, Next because sometimes those have Okay outcomes and other times uh, not okay outcomes. Sometimes it's called a Pagovian tax because uh, this guy in, uh, in Peugeot uh, Out of France invented that this is a kind of a fun thing if you major in economics go get a uh, a graduate degree and you figure something out, they'll name it after you. So you, that guy's been dead for 150 years. We still call those things taxes. So anyway, so if we did that, if we did um, the, the two cent tax, okay, uh, what would happen here is then uh, people wouldn't want to buy as much, okay? And the firms, uh, wouldn't get to sell as much. So now, if, if we had that kind of uh, tax, okay, uh, the new equilibrium would be right here, okay, uh, and it's that point right there. So this would be Q uh, when faced with the tax. We'll do some more examples like this, so it's not as as messy or far away, okay. And so in this example, uh, the consumer is going to pay six cents. The Firm though is only going to get to keep four cents because the tax is uh, is two cents uh, per quantity, right? So the way to figure out this is called tax revenue. We're going to take the the amount of the tax times quantity. Okay, I don't think that's explicitly in my slideshow, but you you might need to know that for the the homework. In fact, you do. Um, tax times quantity will give you tax revenue. So for example, in this case, if the tax is two cents and this quantity right here, I'm, I'm making it up, let's say 800,000. Uh-oh, I don't have a calculator ha handy. Yes, I do. So I'm gonna multiply 
uh, 0 0.02 times 800,000, because that's the quantity now, that's that new quantity right here. The, the old one was a million, okay? So it'd be 16,000 in this, in this example, okay? So $16,000 goes to the government. Uh, the firms are gonna take this four cents times the quantity, and then the consumer's gonna pay more. Okay, so a couple ways to look at this. One is uh, good. We have decreased the environmental damage. We got people to buy less water bottles. Um, there you go. The other way to look at it is, no, this is bad. Um, this creates jobs. Um, maybe this is too much of an estimate. Um, and you've, you've hurt some segment of your economy. Right? I'll let you decide uh, on that. I'm, however, before we leave, we'll, we'll learn a better way to think about that, uh, whether it's good or bad. Okay, so that's how to, how to analyze uh, this, this excise tax. It's one solution that we can use. Uh, your book talks about some other ones, but uh, there you go. Okay, questions on that? This is the, the major one. Thought I heard the, the open mic. Okay, so here's the same thing. Okay, so this is coal. Um, coal is uh, dirty when you mine it, and it's dirty when you burn it, unless you're talking Wyoming coal, which is different than West Virginia coal, but whatever. Um, so again, it's the same graph, marginal uh, private cost, marginal social cost. The distance between those two is the negative externality. Um, and so if we have this equilibrium price plus tax, we can uh, decrease the amount of coal that's produced and uh, get firms to, to produce less of that carbon stuff, okay? So that's the same graph I just drew, but it's in your notes, okay? A little, little nicer, okay? Here's a market for gasoline, okay? Gasoline has a per unit tax. Uh, they use it to pay for the roads. Um, in Europe, they use it to punish drivers. They don't want to have them drive it around. Okay, but let's say that uh, in this analysis, there's one dollar per gallon uh, value of the smog and the greenhouse gases. Okay, so social cost can be the private cost plus the external cost, the externality. So at uh, each level of the supply curve, you're going to go up one dollar uh, per gallon. Right. So here you're going to go from zero to one. You're going to go from one to two. You're going to go from two to three. You're going to go from three to f or 250 to 350, so on and so forth. And so we've got this new marginal social cost. Okay. So without, in sort of a free market, okay, the producers are going to produce to here. It's going to be 250. There's going to be environmental damage. Okay. If the government comes along and we call that the social optimal uh, quantity or the social equilibrium, uh, we would want that to be a decrease, okay? So how much should the tax be to correct this? Uh, we're gonna give it that one, one dollar tax and it acts as a, a decrease in supply and it works out okay, okay? Um, so same way to look at it. And if I, were to, if I were to ask about the tax revenue here, which I will, uh, and on the test too. So 20 is the quantity times the tax, and the tax is just a dollar, so it's just $20, right? Uh, and obviously firms don't like this because now they're gonna sell at $2 instead of at 250, and instead of selling 25 units, they're only gonna sell 20 gallons, right? So uh, they don't like that, okay? Any questions on the analysis of negative externality? Okay, good. Do you always take, oh, sorry, everyone. No, um, Do you always take the, um uh the new equilibrium do you take the new quant or um yeah the new equilibrium and use that if, use the new one on the formula yeah if there's a tax on it yeah so okay. like this is sort of a model right because some sort of statistical wizard has decided that it's uh that the uh, one dollar per gallon is the economic damage, right? The thing that everybody argues about is how much damage that is, right? O only in, you know, crazy town would somebody say, nope, there's no damage caused by burning uh, carbon, you know, uh, machines. Uh, the question is really how much, right, damage is, are we willing to put up with, right? So, so yeah, you're, you're given, you'll be given what the, the damage is or what, or what the tax is, okay? 
Okay, thank you. Good question. All right, any other questions? Okay. Uh, positive externalities. So things can go on around, on around you that are actually helpful. So here are some examples of that. Uh, so vaccines, uh, having this herd immunity actually benefits, you know, I, I've hopefully never been around measles, but uh, I'm also inoculated against it. Well, by not being around measles, that's like really good. And if you have a kid, um, you're likely to have this terrifying moment of the first uh, you know, month or so before they get any shots. I think they get some at the hospital, actually. But there's some other diseases they're not, they're not inoculated against uh, to begin with, right? So it's fairly scary. Um, but anyway, so uh, herd immunity, positive externality. Uh, research and development. So if NASA comes up with some kind of you know, cell phone thing or the GPS that uh, that NASA did, or eh, maybe the military, somebody knows. The U.S. government's responsible for it. Uh, and that's created all kinds of new benefits uh, that companies aren't necessarily paying for, right? Uber isn't necessarily paying the, the government, uh, especially not if they're not paying any corporate taxes, ha, ha, ha. But anyhow, uh, they, they're getting a benefit for something they didn't pay for. Uh, and, and usually society's okay with that, right? We're not, um, not too upset about that. Uh, college education. So the state of Arizona subsidizes your education. So your the real cost of this class is not a thousand dollars. It's it's quite a bit more than that. Well, maybe not if um, not, if all the money's being spent in the right ways. Uh, but there's a definite subsidy. So those of you that own your own own any property in Arizona, you're going to see. Uh, Pima Community College or whatever college you're, you're uh, uh, living in because it, it goes to, to subsidize this. Well, the theory is uh, if we have job skills classes and economics classes and all this stuff, we we should be able to, more people will benefit. There'll be sometimes these are called spillover effects, okay, uh, or extra benefits with positive extra benefits. Okay? Uh, so those are those. You know, you can think about like you know, living near if La Paloma. Um, he does some kind of new cool thing. It's going to bring up property values. Often these have to do with property values, uh, but it could be other things. Uh, you know, like a like a type of business uh, in Reno. There's a Tesla facility there, and that's um, it costs some positive externalities and, and then some negative ones too. Um, so anything like that, um, positive externalities. Questions on any of those? Okay, what does that look like? Okay, so here's the market for flu shots. Okay. We have a downward sloping demand curve, upward sloping supply curve. When they did this, it was $20. That sounds about right. I, I get my flu shot every year for free, part of my insurance, but um, other insurance, that, you know, maybe it'd be about 20 bucks to administer those. Somewhere in there, even if it's five, it's just, the, it's just an example here. Uh, and let's say that there's an external benefit of $10 per flu shot. Okay, so instead of messing with the supply curve, okay, uh, we know what's better for society under a positive externality is if they consume more, right? Because this benefit goes out to people who aren't actually getting the flu shot, right? So what that means is really on the demand side, that this is the private demand, and then there's the societal demand. And so the societal demand, the, the marginal uh, benefit to the rest of society is $10 per shot. So when there's five shots, it's $45, but really the benefit is up here. It's $45, okay? Uh, when it's 30, we get a quantity of, of 10, but the uh, benefit society is 40, okay? When it's 20, which is the equilibrium, uh, really society is going to get $30 worth of benefit. It's an extra $10, okay? Um, so that, that they're not going to get, okay? Well, so, why, sorry to interrupt, but why, why don't mm -hmm. firms build the societal benefit into the into the margin of their own product then like if, if i know that the true value of my product is really providing that much value right like why would i mm. not charge more well um so like a flu shot it's, it's actually something called this perfectly competitive it's like a uh, we'll learn about that next week um they I, I think what you're thinking of is like advertising like they're they're trying to get people to want to get a flu shot in this case? Well, I mean, we lost you. Uh oh, 
We lost you, Justin. I don't hear him. Sorry. Anybody else hear him? Oh, it's okay. Go ahead. I don't know why this thing keeps going on mute. Sorry. Um, no, I'm just basically saying it's like if we can tabulate for negative externalities and then society has to cost adjust, why why can't a firm uh, calculate for positive externalities and then just build that as margin into like if they're if if the product is providing that that much value, why don't we just you know I guess make the good yeah, expensive. Yeah, I get you. So it's it's because the the benefit isn't being uh, received by the person who got the flu shot. So I'm a flu shot guy. I go get the go get it every year, um, and by getting it, I cause positive externalities because I'm not going to get the flu. Therefore, I'm not going to spread the flu throughout uh, Tucson. But the benefit is on you guys, not on me. Right? I only get say twenty dollars worth of benefits in this example. But the actual benefit you're talking about goes to other people, um, and and firms do try to get um, other people to pay for it. What they'll do is they'll do it usually through like a tax um, scheme. Essentially, I've got an example in a second that uh, is actually gotcha. on that that gets at what you're talking about. But that's that's why it is. Okay, it's a good question. Um, so here, if we want to draw that marginal social benefit. Um, we're just gonna increase right here. We're gonna increase the demand because there's additional demand, and that's what Justin's talking about there. Um, so really, for this society and this model, we want 25, but we're not gonna get it because uh, unless uh, somebody else subsidizes it. it. Doesn't necessarily have to be a government. It could be uh, some sort of um, nonprofit group, right? Who sees the value in it. But the value, the benefit is on other people, so they're not gonna, they're not really. Other people are usually gonna be willing to pay for my flu shot, right? Um, you know, you could make a, a, an argument maybe in, in um, some sort of other country where uh, somebody makes the case, hey, we're all in this together, so let's all pool our resources and do this uh, thing like this. Okay, so here's a here's an example I think that, that gets at what Justin's thinking about. So they. Uh, over on the west side, there's a, a Marriott. Um, now I'm forgetting the, the rest of the fancy name. Uh, the Star Pass. It has a, another part of its title. But out of Star Pass, there's this uh, uh, very nice swanky resort, right? So the swanky resort, before be, the Marriott Corporation, before they built it, they, sold the, they told the city of Tucson, we are going to create this resort, but we're also going to give you lots and lots of other benefits. Right, these externalities are going to go into the community. Right, it's going to be more beautiful. Uh, more rich people are going to come to Tucson and hang out and party and go to conferences and stuff like that. So, what you should do is you should subsidize us and give us a tax break. Okay, and the city of Tucson, being that it's, it's fairly liberal, uh, went ahead and did it. They do it uh, frequently. There's lots of businesses around town that, uh, for long periods of time, paid no taxes because they got. Uh, they, they made this case. So they're making a, an externality argument, okay? Um, what, this is what they do with sports stadiums. This, the, the team will say, hey, uh, we're going to create this economic impact in the rest of the city or even the region. Therefore, you should pay uh, for part of the construction, right? Because if you don't pay for it, then we won't build it because the benefits are actually falling on the community rather than us. Now, that there's some problems with that kind of argument. Um, some things that you could object to, and many, many economists have, uh, but that that's the way that that goes. That's how you would use the positive externality side, okay? Uh, any questions on the positive externality story? I have one in general. Um, mm -hmm. So are we seeing it as like the negative externalities affect the supply and the positive affect the demand? Yeah, but it's the societal demand and supply. Oh, okay. Because in a free market, so this is why we call it a market failure, right? In this example, the market left alone is going to produce less uh, quantity than what is best for society, okay? You know, less people will get, um, in this case, flu shots. In the pollution example, um, here, left alone, society is going to overproduce uh, gasoline, okay? And 
there was a, this is even before my time uh but there was a time when american cities you know 80 and even more you know look up old pictures of pittsburgh or butte montana were just covered in pollution because there were no essentially the restrictions so in the free market you're just going to produce as much as you can and and those costs will just just send them down the river or pump it into the into the sky now that's not socially as cool as it used to be um but it was accepted back back in the the, the, the good old days that that's what that's what would happen right so um yes the cost is a is a, is a supply thing and the uh the the benefits is a, is a demand thing. good question okay any other questions over this side of the Story. All right, moving on. Let's do excise taxes and then we're out of here. Um, so, uh, assume the market for life saving pharmaceutical drugs, the demand is relatively inelastic. Okay, so in other words, people that need that drug are willing to pay whatever it is. Um, often they don't have to pay because their insurance company will, but um, anyhow. A different, uh, more complex issue there. And then the supply is relatively elastic because once you've made the recipe for that pill, it's super easy to produce uh, tons and tons and tons of, of uh, units. Okay. Uh, Congress is considering a, oh, there should be a C there, it's behind Mario's pill, uh, considering a per unit tax on every pill sold in the United States. Okay. Now, sort of the, the thinking on this, why would they do this sort of thing? Well, uh, pharmaceutical drug companies make lots and lots of money, right? So uh, the theory here is if we tax the pharmaceutical companies, they'll still produce the thing uh, and the, the consumer will be fine and, and whatever, right? So uh, if the firm raises its price in this market, what's going to happen? Revenue revenue is going to go up because they're facing the in inelastic uh, demand. And there's been many pharmaceutical companies that whether it's an EpiPen or insulin there's many life-saving drugs that they've raised the prices of now consumers up or just people in general get, get upset about that but according to mainstream economic theory they're doing the right thing now it may not be super ethical to do you know a thousand percent markup but it uh it is it is acceptable to raise your price when faced with this issue now the question is who's this tax going to hurt more the drug companies or the, or the consumers and you'll often hear politicians uh, I've heard them, Republican and Democrat in this country, say we should tax pharmaceutical companies or the or the products that they produce. So I, I'm not really a left-right uh, issue. I've heard it from both. I've also heard it opposed by both sides. Uh, so the question is, is per unit tax, who is it going to uh, affect more? Now, I'm not going to answer that question until after we've gone through the, the analysis part. Um, we'll come back to this. Okay, But this is sort of, a, a, a I think, a provocative issue that people have opinions on. We can apply uh, economics to this. Okay, so stepping away from this, uh, here's an example of a, a per unit uh, taxes is in San Francisco. Uh, the uh, there's a ten cent charge on all all bags. So if you don't bring your own bags, you're gonna pay ten cents per bag. Okay, uh, and so the question here is what what is San Francisco trying to do? Well, they're trying to get you to bring your own bag, uh, and if you do have a bag, you're paying that 10 cents, which is supposed to go to, you know, landfill coverage or whatever. So um, we can graph that. Um, and but what we want to do is we want to think about the elasticity of what's going on, right? So is this have an inelastic demand? Yeah, probably, right? It has a pretty elastic supply. So much like the uh, pharmaceutical drug analysis, we'll have an answer to this too. Now in Arizona, uh, so we do have evidence when Communities do this, uh, this is out of San Jose, do actually uh, decrease uh, plastic bag use. Uh, so it, it has had a positive effect. In Arizona, this is illegal. So we're kind of like the anti-California uh, based on the policy choices that, that our, our politicians have made. I'm not saying that that's good or bad, it's just we have an opposite uh, economic system here, I guess, uh, when it comes to plastic bags. So it's not legal for communities to charge or to require stores to charge this uh, fee or what's really just a tax, okay? Um, so Bisbee tried it and they're fighting it in courts, but um, you won't see something like this uh, in Arizona, okay? At least until there's some kind of law change, right? Now maybe you think, oh, that's terrible. 
should be a law change, that it's fine. Then, then enact policies to, to do that or vote or talk to your uh, legislature. If you think it's awesome, you know, uh, leave it and, you know, uh, talk to them that way, right? So that's, that's, that's cool. All right. Let me give you an example uh, for the graph here. All right. So cigarettes. All right. So highly addictive, highly inelastic demand. And in the good old days, uh, cigarette companies did some fairly shady uh, sort of advertising. Here you've got them advertising on The Simpsons. Um, they'd have, uh, you know, when I was a kid in the 80s, there was this guy named Joe Camel. Joe Camel was this really cool cartoon character, you know, motorcycle, all kinds of fun things. He's like a cool guy. Want to be like Joe Camel. Never picked up smoking, so that's good. But he was... He was definitely pretty cool. So a lot of people pick up smoking when they're relatively young because the uh, tobacco companies in the, in the 40s and 50s and 60s um, did ads like these. Uh, and so a lot of people said, hey, um, we should tax cigarettes because we're gonna try to hurt the tobacco companies. That was the intention of the policy, okay? Uh, now, different states have different uh, cigarette taxes. In, in Arizona, it's $2 a pack. Okay, you can see that right there. Uh, California's 287, Washington's $3. Where's the cheapest? Uh, Idaho's pretty cheap. Tobacco Road down here where the cigarettes are produced. So, uh, unfortunately, with 50 different states and 50 different economic experiments going on, uh, some of you should look at the state of New York, $4.35. Not that far from North Carolina or Virginia where it's 30 cents. So, Unfortunately, Mafia has been buying cigarettes for a number of years, driving them up to where there was low tax, drive them up to New York, sell them on the black market, use those profits for all kinds of other negative things. Uh, so how, how your state picks the, the tobacco tax is going to be uh, an issue too. This is a new thing. A lot of students are into these e-cigs. These e uh, be careful because there's a lot of evidence that the, the, the COVID hurts these uh, e-cig people more. But anyhow, uh, Arizona doesn't have a, an excise tax on the vape juice, uh, but these blue states do. Okay, uh, so that's sort of a new a new thing, and you could see uh, you could see at some point that being uh, introduced. Okay, but anyway, so the the cigarette tax exists; it's two dollars per pack. But what we want to know is who bears the bigger burden of the per unit tax or the excise tax. It's the same thing. Okay, it's just the fancier name uh, of the tax. So the way to answer that question, now if you didn't take any economics, you say, well, hell yeah, the, the tobacco company's got to pay and they get to pay it, pay a million dollars, right? Um, what we really want to think about is the burden, right? Who is affected more? Who loses more, gives up more, okay? So what we're going to do is, uh, I think I can draw right on this, but I want, where, where's the pen? There it is, draw. And I like that red. And I do like a bluish. Oh, it's like a purpley thing. Okay, uh, let's try it. Okay, so cigarettes uh, on the demand side, and I turn back to red. Whatever, uh, we're going to be pretty inelastic. Okay, uh, and what that means is it's pretty steep. Okay, because people that that smoke, they you know they buy their two packs a day, and that's that's what they do, right? So I've got this in elastic demand curve, okay? Relatively inelastic, we might say. Now, what about the supply? How, geez, how difficult is it to make cigarettes? Like, is that a hard product or a, an easy product? And I'm gonna argue that that's an easy product to make, right? It's uh, a filter, piece of paper, some tobacco. Uh, if you go to YouTube, you can see like, cigarette factory, you know, they just produce like hundreds of millions of units, uh, pretty crazy. So that's pretty elastic on the supply side, okay? Because it's easy, okay? Uh, it's pretty inelastic on the demand side because people are hooked, but on the supply side, it's pretty elastic. So let's draw, I wanna, I wanna do a $2. So I'll say I don't know exactly how much price pack cigarettes is, so. That's probably good. All right, let's say a more elastic demand, or supply rather, sorry. Sorry, that's in red. So here is S. Now, that's just if the market is left alone, right? So 
equilibrium price of like 550. Okay. And along comes the state of Arizona and the AZ tax, which is my understanding on the bottom of the pack of cigarettes, got that little tax stamp. That's what that is, right? So it's $2 per pack. Okay. This down here, this is quantity in packs. This is price. Okay. So when the, the price is two, we're going to add two to the, or sorry, when the price is three, we're going to add two to that. We get to five. Okay. Coming on over here when the price is four, which is of that quantity of three, three million cigarettes, packs, whatever. We're going to go to here. 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 And the way I'm going to write that, Okay, is S plus tax. Okay, so state of Arizona is doing two things. One, they want people to smoke less, uh, and then they also the, the the negative externality really comes in uh, with you know if you're poor in Arizona and you go to the hospital, they're gonna fix you up, right? It's, it's we call it access, but it's really Medicaid and stuff like that, right? Um, I get kind of a chuckle, people. Uh, debate about you know socialized medicine right if you're if you're old you can get uh, Medicare and if you're really young and poor you can get Medicaid right so it's it's these uh, middle-aged folks right we have to pay so it's always getting us anyway doesn't matter so uh, they're trying to use this to get people to smoke less so they want the quantity to go down but then they also want um, uh, they want the tax revenue to go to the hospitals right to pay for uh, health care for the old and health care for the young the theory here is that the tobacco companies are evil because they they hooked people when they were young, right? So you can agree with that or not agree with that, but that's kind of the way that it goes. Okay, so here I've got my tax, I've got my demand curve. Okay, so with the tax, okay, the cigarette companies are now going to sell five instead of six. So we did get a decrease in quantity, and uh, we got this higher price. So we now have a dead weight loss. Okay, like we were looking at last week. And I'm going to split the dead weight loss in two. The dead weight loss would be this triangle right here. Sorry, that's a little, little uh, sketchy there. Uh -huh, uh -huh, it's sketching it out. Okay. Uh, stuff kills people sometimes. Anyway, so here I've got this right here. This this triangle. I wish I could do a different color. That's the dead weight loss on consumers, and over here. This is the dead weight loss on producers or on the supply side. Okay, uh, and we can actually see that they're they're different sizes. Okay, and the dead weight loss is the loss in efficiency or it's the loss in uh, the market. Okay, uh, based on in this case it's a tax. Okay, uh, could be some other kind of a market issue, but here we've got this this tax. So uh, the dead weight loss for consumers is bigger than the dead weight loss for producers. Yes, producers are going to lose out a little bit because of this tax, but it's really the burden of the tax is on these guys. Okay. Um, so when you're figuring this out, the rule is if we want to know who has the bigger burden, it's whoever's elasticity is steeper or whoever has a more inelastic curve. Okay. So in this case, if the state of Arizona was trying to stick it to tobacco companies, they failed, okay? Because really what they did is they burdened the smokers more and they're still gonna buy it. We're not gonna get this huge decrease in quantity like we thought we would, okay? Uh, so that's that tax analysis. So what this shows us is that sometimes well-meaning politicians can make uh, a mistake because they didn't consider the microeconomics of the, of the market, okay? Who has a question on that? So we're going to just look for whoever's uh, dead weight loss is bigger. Okay. Okay. I'll wait because sometimes it takes a second. Yeah. All right. Let's do a different one. Okay. Not everybody. Some people like these two people. They don't like rich people. All right. So in the chat window, give me uh, some products that only ultra high net worth individuals would buy so there's this term so like in the old days you'd say oh that person's a millionaire but a million bucks isn't that much money anymore uh it's still a lot of money but it's not what it once was 
uh, and these people aren't necessarily billionaires. So they're like households that have a hundred million dollars or more. Okay. So, uh, call them ultra high net worth individuals. So in the chat window, products that only rich, rich households, uh, would buy. Do I keep it? Let's see what happens. Private uh, jet or a yacht or something. Okay. Very good. Uh, and then I don't know. Are you able to type it in there too or no? Somebody's already got jets. There we go. Jet, yacht, mansion. What else does the 1% buy? Give me some new, some new examples. There you go. Tesla. Oh, art, private security. Very good. There you go. Yeah, see? See, I'm not around rich people like you guys are, right? You got some good, good ideas. So these are all great ideas. Okay. So the one I'm going to pick here is a yacht. Okay. So a yacht is something that only high net worth individuals will purchase. Okay. Uh, but these are produced by companies. Okay. And if we look at the yacht, it's not a simple product uh, to make. Okay. So on the supply side, it's actually relatively inelastic because it's complex, requires lots of people, lots of design, uh, and it just takes a while to make a boat, right? Uh, especially a fancy boat. Okay. So we've got a pretty inelastic supply. Okay. If you're ever in the market for yachts, uh, and actually, well, I was about to say right now would be a good time to, to buy a yacht, but with the uh, precipitous uh, increase in the stock uh, asset values in the, in the last month or so, uh, it might not be such a good idea to, to buy, uh, buy one of these. So you might, might want to hold off on buying your yacht for a year. We'll see what happens next year. But uh, anyhow, you can, get a, you can get a used yacht. It's like the eBay of yachts. All right, so the question here is, well, so let's say, uh, that uh, politicians decided, you know what, got to tax the rich. Now, we're not going to do their income tax because then they won't vote for us. So we'll hit them with a, what's called a consumption tax or an excise tax on luxury yachts. Okay, so what we want to know is who bears the bigger burden of a per unit tax. Okay, so now, let's see if I can fill in there. I can. And then by testing out the pen, I just covered it up. Okay, right. so on the supply side, We've got an inelastic supply, okay? And that's what I just said, right? It's complex, uh, it takes a lot of time, uh, you know, some engineering involved there. Um, you know, it's got all kinds of fancy stuff. Okay, what about the demand though? Okay, rich people are not stupid or they wouldn't be uh, you know, as wealthy as they are. Uh, and so when they buy a yacht, they usually wait for the best deal. Right? And it's not something that they have to have, right? There's many rich people that don't have one. Uh, and then rich people that do have them often uh, sell them and you know, they're looking at getting the best deal, right? So what that means, because this is a luxury item and that's one of the, the uh, determinants of elasticity, uh, we're talking uh, elastic demand, right? The, the, the consumer can wait, uh, it's not a need, oops, not a need. Okay, they, they can hold off on that. So, uh, all right, so we're going to drop this market. So now I've got a uh, relatively inelastic supply here. Right, so I'm drawing that uh, pretty steep, which, by the way, I, I haven't graded the homework yet. Um, but oh, how could I? It was just due. Um, but that's kind of what the Raiders uh, question was. Uh, so it's pretty steep, right? So that answer when you get to that or when you see that um well that's a little should be uh, yeah that's just terrible yeah it should be like this at like seventy-five thousand seats right because they uh there's the price and there's the quantity that's just how the amount of seats that this the stadium holds uh, anyway so we've got this uh supply here and then uh we'll start right at that Okay, so here comes the demand for this. Okay, relatively. Uh, 
to the elastic. I don't know if I can, you know what you do? You just make the dot bigger. And I'm, no, that'll work. Okay, so there's my demand. Okay. Thing there. All right, and so the government comes in and says, yeah, let's stick it to rich people. And so we're going to do a tax. We'll call it a 10% tax. We're going to tax all the, the, uh, the yachts 10% on each quantity, right? So it'll be S plus 10% will be the 10% so will be that. So I'm going to draw this about here. It's about here. Doing that right? Yeah. Here and this about here. So this guy right here, this is S plus the tax, okay? And so remember, the purpose of this was to stick it to the rich people or rather get them to pay more here. And here I'm going to break up the, the dead weight loss. Uh, and I've got, this is the dead weight loss to producers. And this triangle right here is the dead weight loss to consumers, okay? And it's consumers are the rich people. Okay, so their dead weight loss is smaller than the dead weight loss from uh, the producer. So in this case, did the tax have its uh, uh, desired outcome? And the answer really is no, because uh, it's the producer who bears, sorry, that's so messy. Uh, the producer bears the bigger burden, right? Then it's not that the rich people won't be burdened at all. So don't, don't think I'm saying that. It's just that the burden's gonna fall on the companies that produce these yachts. So um, why is that bad? Why, why did that, why was that a mistake? I suppose it depends on how you look at it, really. You know what I mean? I if the government's goal was to get tax Wait, revenue I, you you got we lost you when you said it depends on how you look at it and then and then you're mute. Uh, yeah i'm just gonna type it sorry okay okay it's gonna type it let's read it all right let's hit keep here and serious says and anybody else you can answer to question is what's the what's the mistake here we, we wanted to tax the rich. We ended up taxing the producers rather than the rich consumers. Well, there's the tax is gonna hit the market, but the burden of the tax falls more on the consumers. It almost might depend on whether you make the boats yourself in the, in your state. Yeah, so that, that matters too, right? If, if the burden falls on the uh, state of Washington rather than Arizona, sure. Well, uh, well, I if, wouldn't imagine. But yeah, of course, you're not going to need them in Kansas, but nonetheless. But, um, but if you're hiring a whole bunch of people who are making them there, that is going to be effective. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. What, what Robert's saying, I'm going to think about Justin. I'm going to read Justin's and think about it a little bit more. But um, what Robert's saying is is what the, the point that we're trying to make here, right? Uh, the yachts are made by not rich people, right? There's there's com or there's people that work for those companies uh, who make the yachts, and we've just made their life a little bit harder because now the the quantity uh, of yachts is going to be decreasing because of this tax that we intended on uh, getting the, the wealthy people. So let's see what he says. Yeah, dude, Justin, you're, you're, actually, you're right. Of course, there's more than one way to look at it. Um, the point I want you guys to see, though, is that when you have a tax, an excise tax, and you're trying to, uh, say, in this case, uh, have the burden fall on rich people, you have to be careful with how you design the tax, right? Or if the burden is to, to tax cigarette companies or companies doing bad things, you have to make sure that uh, the burden falls on the companies rather than the, uh, the consumer. Okay. And sure, uh, you know, you could make an, uh, an environmental argument uh, some other way. Okay. All right. Last example. Here you go. Soda. Okay. 
So soda uh, has a negative externality because it uh, increases rates of diabetes and obesity and all those other things. Uh, and so uh, what the city of Philadelphia has done and a couple other places have done this too, uh, they have a 1.5 cent per ounce. Uh, and so what it is, is like a buck, the dollar tax on a dollar fifty bottle of soda. Uh, they also tax things that don't have sugar in them, like diet soda, uh, but they but fruit juices were, were excluded, okay? So what this looks like in Philadelphia, so in Arizona there's no tax on this, but in Philadelphia there is. So if a 12-ounce uh, can costs 50 cents, the price plus the tax is 68 cents, okay? Um, so if you multiply that times like a 12-pack, then that's going to significantly raise the price of the 12 pack okay now rather than graphing this out i'm going to tell you what the elasticities are okay, and see if you can graph it real quick uh, so when they do soda turns out and this is the actual um, economic uh, uh, theory that they used or at least the number that they used they they uh found or rather the the numbers that they were using uh was the the demand elasticity the price elasticity of demand was 2.2 and the supply elasticity was 2.1 okay so 2.2 and 2.1 see if you can uh, quickly sketch out what that would look like in your notes think about what two an elasticity of two 2.2 and I guess I lied. I'm going to do it. Uh, so we'll come down here. I don't know why I lied. I changed my mind. So, oops. Hey, whoop. Okay, I want it to stop drawing. Select. Get that out of the way. I want this guy. Looking for soda. That back to the independent. Okay, so if the price elasticity of demand is 2.2, that is relatively elastic. Okay, because remember, any number above one is elastic. Okay, so 2.2, and then the price elasticity of supply is 2.1. Okay, so what that means is we've got relatively elastic demand, and relatively elastic supply. So I'm going to draw out these guys, so kind of like this. Kind of like that. They're pretty much the same. If I zoom in here on my market. So that was fifty cents. Okay, and so that kind of works out if this is in uh, 50 cent units, okay? Uh, so we're gonna charge this purple tax of, is it one point or 18? Okay, so we'll just go up here, okay? And that's, this is now S plus, oops, oops plus tax, which is that 1.5. Uh, percent and then I come in here and it, you can do this this with different colors so this is uh, a little bit easier so this is the new equilibrium so here was the old equilibrium was over here okay it's in the unregulated market and then we city of Philadelphia comes in with this tax and I've got this new equilibrium so we've lost some so it's it's this this is our dead weight loss okay and you can see it right here that it's here, now I'm going to color them. Let's do like the orange color here. Go in like this. So the, the orange, it's a little crooked. Orange is the dead weight loss on the consumers. And we'll say the red, dead weight loss on the producers. 
you know, you could do the math on it. We know that the burden is going to be slightly more on the, the sellers because theirs is a little bit less elastic, but it's pretty much the same. Okay. So the last thing that we want to uh, recognize here is that if the elasticity is the same, then the burden is the same. Okay. So we look for the, the rule kind of is to look for the inelastic curves, but if it's the same, you're going to burden both sides the same. And so for the city of Philadelphia, uh, you know, I don't know that they were happy with it, but they, you know, this is okay. Okay. You know, the consumer's not, not bearing a bigger burden than the, the sellers, right? Um, you've got the companies selling this, the sugary product, uh, which is creating the externality and then the people who are buying it. So what they're trying to do is trying to get the quantity to go down and there you go. Right. So similar thing happens with alcohol tax. There's a big alcohol tax in, in Arizona. Um, and really they're trying to get to try to decrease the amount of alcohol consumption, uh, in the state. And, uh, they're okay with it because it got kind of similar elasticities, right? However, usually the companies, and it was the companies in this case, companies will really oppose this because unlike the, the price floor last week that I presented, the tax only goes to the government, right? The uh, Coke and Pepsi don't get to keep that additional tax, right? So it's not like this is an increase in supply. It's, a, it's S plus tax. So that's... Uh, is it on that? So some other elast or some other excise taxes. This is the state of Arizona. So you pay uh, is it thirty seven point four cents per gallon uh, is tax. Okay, so eighteen cents goes to the federal government. Eighteen cents goes to Arizona, and that well, it's really nineteen cents because that additional one. So next time you're filling up your car, uh, look around. They have to have that sticker posted on it, and it tells you what the tax is. So some economists think. No way, man. That, that tax is too low. They should pay for more uh, roads and stuff like that. And other, other economists say, you know what? It's too high because uh, the roads have a positive externality. So you can see kind of the debate uh, working, working through there. Here's gas taxes in different states. There's ours, 19 cents. California, 54. Other states, much higher. Uh, other states have better roads. Some, some states have worse. It's just how it goes. Okay. So uh, somebody uh, asked if this will be on our midterm. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, it will. So uh, it's also um, on next week's homework. This is the, the ball convention. So that yeah, will be on your final. Too. But beyond the test, I mean, it's, it's good because we're, we're going to have these new problems. I mean, like, should we tax e-cig juice? Should we not tax e-cig juice? Should we lower the cigarette tax? raise the, the alcohol tax, right? Should we have a, a consumption tax on these other things that you guys wrote down, right? Art, uh, private jets. Uh, recently, the tax on private jet ownership has decreased, right? So maybe that was a good idea. Maybe it wasn't. Okay. So, so good questions. Okay. Well, that's what why I got do, for you. Why do we keep bad taxes? Like if we know that something, if, if it's demonstrable that it doesn't benefit anything, is it just because the government gets used to having the money to spend or what's the deal? Oh, uh, it depends. I mean, the story that I've given you about, um, you know, the soda tax. So there's a pretty famous economist named Larry Summers. He's worried about um, uh, obesity. And he says, this is a great idea. We should do this everywhere. Right. Or there's other economists that want like a carbon tax on it. Right. Whereas there are other economists say this is a terrible idea. Right. It's counter to Adam Smith. And if people want to be fat and lazy and and drive too much, then that's uh, there's. I think it, it likely has to do with the uh, specific amount of money that we're talking about. Um, and I don't know, I, I'll make this statement. I think Americans' lack in economic education is the source of many of our disagreements. And if we sat down and said, hey, let's actually look at the elasticities of these things, uh, we might not have as many angry uh, Facebook posts and stuff, but uh, I don't know, that's just me. Good question. So, Justin, you you fix it. I don't know about all that, bro. No, no, I gotta fix it. Okay. Well, then give money to people to fix it. So there you go. When, when you're wealthy, they are, they already take it. They already yeah, take no. it from me. That's well, I mean, good. like, no, I don't mean like the government. I mean like uh, like policymakers or like sane politicians, right? That, that, that 
took an economics class. Oh, when you find one of those, holler at me for sure. <laughs> well, we, they they exist. They just uh, they don't usually get elected because they're they're nerds. So. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. So there we go. Well, I hope to see you tomorrow. And uh, shoot me an email if you have any questions.